Welcome to the tensile test according to DIN EN ISO 6892. Today we are in the material testing laboratory. You will see the testing machine to the left and the monitors for evaluating the data to the right. Tensile test specimens come in different shapes. First, we'll see a flat sample. There's also round ones, as it is the case with this cylindrical rod. Thirdly, we have another round test piece this time a shorter cylindrical rod. We're going to run two tests. The first one will be done on a material with a defined yield strength. We start by marking the original length L0 on the test specimen that has a precise yield point. Using a permanent marker will allow us afterwards to evaluate everything manually. Before starting the test, we'll also note and check the original diameter, D0. From it, we can also calculate the original cross-sectional area, noted as S0, just by using the relevant formula for the area, in this case, a circle. The test specimen is then screwed into threaded grips on both ends, which will in turn be inserted into the testing machine. After securing the grips holding the specimen, the tensile test begins by attaching an extensometer. By measuring the specimen directly, the extension can be determined more precisely. Pictured on the right is the stress-strain curve. It starts with a straight line representing the linear elasticity stage following Hooke's law. Below the graph, you'll see the force applied, measured in newtons, and the elongation, measured in millimeters. The linear elasticity stage is followed by the yielding region, also known as the flow region. When surpassing the end of the yielding point, we now enter the strain hardening range, as the curve continues to rise until we reach the ultimate tensile strength, known as UTS, or in this case RM. The stress increases until Rm is reached. From then onwards, both the force and the cross-section start to decrease. This phenomenon, called necking, is quite evident towards the middle of the specimen and it will increase until the point of fracture. After the sample breaks, the grips can be loosened and the test specimen can be unscrewed. We can further analyse the fracture shape where the necking occurred and recognise a cone cob fracture, typically characterised by a 45 degree fracture surface at the rim and a 90 degree fracture surface at the core. Let's look at the diagram in more detail. The stress curve starts with a straight line, showing linear elasticity according to Hooke's law, and ends at the upper yield strength, here noted as REH. In the yield zone, we can also see the lower yield strength, REL. The ultimate tensile strength, RM, is the highest point of the curve. The formulas are as follows. The upper yield strength, REH, corresponds to the force at the upper yield point, divided by the original cross-sectional area, noted as S0. The lower yield strength, REL, is the force at the lower line divided by the original cross-section, and RM is the maximum force divided once again by the original cross-section. Here we see in the diagram the aforementioned stress values RM, REH and REL and the corresponding strains, AG and AGT, are the strains at ultimate tensile strength, and A and AT are the strains at the point of fracture. The most significant of these values are AG and A, since they are noted after unloading the sample. Now it's time to test the material without yield point phenomenon. The test begins just as before, with a specimen being placed in the grips. 
Once again on the right, we see the accompanying stress-strain diagram, and below it, the basic physical quantities, force in newtons and elongation in millimetres. As in the case of the material with a pronounced yield strength, we begin by determining Young's modulus in hook abiding linear elasticity, or simply put, the slope of the initial straight line. The strain hardening ends when the maximum tensile strength is reached. There, as in the previous test, the necking begins and continues until fracture as can be seen in the specimen on the left. After the end of the test, the fracture shape is determined and in this case we see a shear fracture. The fracture surface is strictly below 45 degrees to the loading axis. Again, let's take a look at the diagram in detail. Since we don't have a distinct yield strength here, we need a substitute value. In this case, the 0.2% proof stress RP 0.2. This is determined by a parallel along the elasticity region's line at 0.2% strain. The calculation is analogous to the previous test. That is, RP 0.2 is the force at the 0.2% yield stress divided by the original cross-section, or S0. Let's manually determine the elongation up to the point of fracture. The specimen pieces are held together on a base to measure the length after fracture, or LU, evident by the marks made previously. The measurement taken is then entered into the software. To determine the percentage reduction of area, we also need the diameter after the fracture, or DU. This is also measured while the specimen is held together in place, and the result is also transferred to the software. Comparing the two curves directly, first test being above and the second test below, we see a clear difference in the curve progression. The curve above clearly shows a pronounced yielding region, or flow region, while the curve below shows a direct transition into the strain hardening stage. There's also an obvious difference between the two ultimate tensile strengths and between the two elongations to the point of fracture. To better compare the difference between each material's Young's modulus, we'll zoom in on this area. Here, we see a clear difference in the two slopes, showing the ratio between the two materials to be about 3 to 1. 